Hello and a very warm welcome along. Great to have you with us for the next two hours for coverage of the 77th Women's Boat Race and 168th Men's Boat Race between the Universities of Oxford and Cambridge. It's one of the oldest sporting fixtures in the world. There's 6.8 kilometres of gruelling side-by-side -side racing coming up along the iconic tideway course of the River Thames. To give you an idea of the conditions then as we look out at Putney bridge at the start line it's about eight to nine degrees celsius out there in west london but it is dry we had a lot of rain earlier no rain at the moment the winds north northeastly about 10 to 15 miles per hour could get a few gusts though similar story forecast for the men's race later on as well staying at around eight degrees more northerly winds with the odd gusts of 20 to 25 miles per hour you're with me katie smith the women's race is set to go off in just under 15 minutes time the men's race an hour after that and in between we'll be dipping into what life has been like for the crews across the last six to seven months of training first though let's have a look at the course the crews will be racing on today guarding you through our commentator Andrew Cotter. It is just over four miles of the twisting Thames between Putney and Mortlake, racing upstream, but with the flow of the incoming tide, the crews choose either the south bank, the Surrey station, or the north, which is Middlesex. The initial slight advantage is to Middlesex around Fulham's Craven Cottage. After three and a half to four minutes, the mile marker is reached and the landmark of the former Harrods Furniture Depository before Hammersmith Bridge. The majority of crews leading here go on to win, and now the bend favours the Surrey side. A large sweeping turn past half way into the strait of Chiswick Reach and past the island Chiswick 8. Quite often into a headwind this can be exposed and rougher water. A final slight bend to Surrey and then it turns back to favour the north bank under Barnes Bridge into the final thousand metres and towards the finish just before Chiswick Bridge. So that is Putney Bridge there. And you can see the Cambridge crew just to the left-hand side of your screen. There we go. Cambridge and Oxford warming up. They've been out on the water for the past half an hour. Their final few moments to get warmed up, feel the rhythm of the boat, try and put away any last-minute nerves and get ready for the buzz and noise of the thousands of fans lining the banks of the River Thames. You can hear the helicopter circling above as well. One boat race winning Cox I spoke to ahead of today said it is deafening on the start line but away from the noise then away from the cameras what has life been like for the Cambridge women they won the race last year they won the reserve race last year as well but there's only one returner here in 2023 that is President Cleaver Dempsey she'll be sitting in the stroke seat plus they have the only rower with any senior international racing experience across any of the crews out on the water today Canadian Claire Brion My research is on the topic of music and emotion, so I'm very curious about the emotional reactions that are provoked by music listening. I started seeing a lot of parallels between rowing and singing, like breath control, core strength to an extent, um, posture comes into it. So yeah, I think there, there are lots of parallels. And then there's also, there's rhythm, and then there's the fact that music is constantly in my head, especially when I'm rowing, and that rowing is in my head when I'm singing. <laughs> so, so everything plays into each other. Hard, but don't rush it. I'm nervous every year. In terms of physicality, this, this crew, is, well, the whole squad is more physical than it has been in quite a number of years. Yeah, I'm the only returning blue. Stroke seat is kind of pressure, I feel like, and then stroke seat as president is like a big jumble. And so I have a lot of motivation this year, as you can imagine. I don't really want to be described as tough, but um, you know, when the tough decisions need to be made, I'm, um, I'm quite comfortable making them. All right, let's go, get, get out of here. I feel a lot of pressure for them to reflect and say, hey, he was an amazing coach, he was, uh, a caring human being and that you felt respected through the journey. That's pretty important to me. Yeah, I've had a lot of doubts. Um, I guess that's just sort of my personality is to kind of question myself and ask if I'm doing everything I can. Um, so yeah, I, it has been hard, but that's what makes like it satisfying when you feel like you've done something. 
I think our crew is really, really tenacious. I think that was shown in our tri -lates race. It was neck and neck all the way to the line, and both crews were absolutely gunning for it. I think it shows real qualities of, like, we will never give up and never, never stop pushing. It's really rewarding to kind of see physically how you can develop and, and how you can kind of perfect um, your sport. But then, you know, in what other situation do you get to spend like all of this time with a group of like 40 odd girls? Wait for the BBC! Tanya! I am quite young in comparison to some people in the boat, so I guess just kind of more of an easygoing approach to the row. So whilst everything's serious when you're on the water, you can kind of take a step back from it when you're off the water and think. Like, this is all part of a big picture. We don't need to get caught up in little things. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Blend the chili briefly with an immersion blender. A circle, a circle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good, good, good. Now stop. Now mix it. <laughs> it doesn't look any different, though. Nothing smells better than onions. Well, um, we found out the other evening that the girls think I'm a strong motivator. Mm. Clay, you bring lots of noise. Mm. Yeah, really good hype. Yeah, you bring really good hype. I think that confidence is so important and we play into each other's confidence a lot. You know, we care so much about each other and um, we spend a lot of time, oh, God, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> the team is so tight. It's like, I think, you know, especially with, um, as one of the more experienced people in the team, I realize that my role is like very much a leadership one. And, um, and so I think that it's important to take that seriously and use it to the benefit of my teammates, you know. I am surrounded by some pretty extraordinary women, and uh, they, are at, you know, some of them will add extraordinary value to not just this country but this world. If anyone were to say, "Oh my God, you're the favourites," I would say, "Hold on, <laughs> don't don't say that yet. Um, I don't want to jinx it, you know. So I'd rather just wait and see what happens." slice of life in amongst the Cambridge squad and you can see the banks of the Thames really filling up now this is Putney embankment it's just by the start line of the race it's where they boated about half an hour ago in the corner of your screen you can see Craven Cottage the football ground of Fulham as well so many iconic landmarks on this 6.8 kilometer course now Cambridge have a lot to shout about and they had a lot of support as they boated around 30 minutes ago they've been the form setters in the women's race, winning the past six editions in a row. Oxford, in fact, have to go back to 2015 to their last victory. 15 lengths, though, and the first time the women's race was held on the Tideway on that full championship course on the same day as the men's race. We're just having a look inside the Cambridge boat at the moment. Uh, now, the past two years, the women's crews have really been getting closer together in the races. Oxford a relatively inexperienced crew, though, coming into today. No returning blues in their boat. Four members of the crew have race experience, though, in the losing Osiris reserve boat in 2022. So let's see how life has been in the build-up for the dark blues. I've always been obsessed with space. Ever since I was little, I wanted to be an astronaut, and I still want to be an astronaut. I love what I do. It's incredibly exciting. I love thinking about just being able to look up at night and see the work that I do, even though the stuff that I look at is very far away and you can't see it with your own eyes. So this is the Department of Astrophysics. We're heading to my office and um, in the tower, we have a nice little view over Oxford. I just fell in love with the way you can use mathematics to describe the stuff that we see around us um, and the stuff that we can't see, like all of the, um, the physical underpinnings of every day. Okay. If I'm having a little bit of trouble working out a problem in my degree, I can go to the water and just, you know, plant some puddles in a river. And, um, or likewise, if I'm finding training hard or just the, the stress of selection is getting to me, I can come here and code and I um, think just switch gears a bit and it really, I think it helps. I think we found quite a lot of talent 
that we didn't necessarily know we had at the beginning of the year. There's some exceptional athletes, some very strong people who've developed, whose rowing's come on in leaps and bounds, and you know, they're really enjoying it, and they're enjoying the process. With a less experienced group, you'll find that there's probably more basic teaching in the early part of the year, so your rate of improvement may well be on a different trajectory to one where you've you know, got a more experienced group. But there'll always be a point where you have to find a way of bringing that group together. I think with age does, <laughs> does come wisdom um, and an element of leadership there, but as a whole, I think we're all pretty strong individuals. Um, we all provide elements of leadership as well. And I think rowing's probably the one sport where you actually don't have captains. The determination in the eight other girls sat in that boat is incredible. And like the grit that is brought to every single session um, is truly remarkable. And I, I just love working together for the same end goal. I love sitting in the bow. I get to see everybody. Um, when the boat's going well, it feels like it's flying. I, it feels like we're all nine of us are one body, one mind. It just, it's an incredible feeling. I didn't row before coming to Oxford. Um, I remember I first watched the boat race in 2019 when I was applying to Oxford. Um, watched it on TV and now I'm in my fourth year and definitely did not imagine myself here. Um, just enjoyed it, made some great friends, enjoyed the process. Day four training camp, here we come. Hi <laughs> What's the best post rowing snack? Selfie roll. It's fine. Roll it. We have some really good bakers on our team mm. as well, who have brought in lots of things. We have uh, bring in birthday cake if it's anyone's birthday. So we've had some really impressive bakes for that. Um, I like cooking. I like cooking for friends because again, that's kind of like a social tick in the box. Um, and you're eating, and you can make sure you're eating enough, which is really hard with training. Once the crew's got named, we started doing crew dinners. This is quite part of team bonding. It's been nice. It's like something to look forward to each week, I guess. So the beauty of the boat race, it's pretty binary and it's risky. You, know, you only get one go a year. You, know, you put your career on the line for that. When it starts getting tough, I just remember this is part of it. This is part of it. People don't remember the nine names that won the boat race. They remember if Oxford won it. I just want to win one. I just here to win one. Andrew Nelder, the head coach there of Oxford Women. He just wants to win one. He hasn't won since taking charge in 2017. Does that change today? It all comes down to now. The crews are on their starting boats. They do a coin toss before the race to choose which bank they start on. Oxford called heads, but it was tails. So Cambridge president uh, Kviva Dempsey chose the Surrey bank. And you can see the light blue of Cambridge on the right hand side of your screen, the dark blue of Oxford on the left. So this is it. The uh, Cambridge Cox, James Trotman, hand in the air to signify he is not quite ready, but we are ready now to hand to our commentary team to guide you through this one. Grace Prendergast, 2022 winner with Cambridge. Zoe de Toledo, 2012 Cox for Oxford. And our commentator, Andrew Cotter. Well, the crowds have come. The crowds have come out in their hundreds and their thousands, and they line up there on Putney Bridge. And the vagaries of the spring weather. Today, the wind comes down from the north northeast, and the temperature has dropped. There will be a bit of life in the river, and the challenge of the boat race is as much in dealing with that as with the opposition. And they wait on the stake boats. The hands up. Oh, one hand up, hand up from James Trotman, indicating that he is Cox for the Cambridge Cruise. Not happy, but he is happy now. And they settle in, ready to go. His hands back up. My hands but then back the hand up. goes up, and so the hand of uh, Tara Slade goes up as well. A little smile there from Esther Austin. 
The New Zealander at stroke and the Oxford boat looking across. It's nervous, down. nervous moments, and it all builds up to this in the next 20 minutes or so. Attention, go! And Matt Smith umpiring his first boat race. Great oarsman himself. Says attention, go, and away they go. And they train and practice these starts over and over again. There are about 600 strokes in a boat race, but the first few are so, so important. The building blocks for everything that comes afterwards. And Oxford looked to got off to a bright start here. Again, the angle is deceptive and we'll see who has got the early advantage. Looked like a really punchy start there from Oxford, actually. Not necessarily that clean, but very, very aggressive. They really went for it there off the blocks. They really did, and I think once you get those first few strokes out of the way, you can breathe a sigh of relief. It's a tricky way to start a boat race. Um, the Cambridge crew's taking a pretty aggressive turn back into the Oxford crew, but both, both crews have got out of the danger of those first few strokes. And so Grace, who was in the Cambridge boat last year, that so, so powerful boat, and the dark blue boat of Oxford last year was so strong as well. Very different feel to things this year, but this is a strong start as we look towards Bishop's Park and here at the boat houses, looking over the crowds towards them as they come past in a surge of spray and effort. And they go out so, so hard. You got out 40 strokes a minute and then settle down into a rhythm of perhaps 34 or so, but this is going to be such effort for the next 20 minutes and there's a good view there of Craven Cottage as they creep around there they'll be heading north into the wind and that's when the river really will come to life yeah we we might be in for some bumpy water so this next phase is going to be really important that both crews get on a good rhythm that regardless of what conditions are going to be thrown at them later in the race they they have a rhythm that can withstand it and and push through it and you've got to be really confident as well in this rough water to find a good strong rhythm as well. You you can't keep spinning up with lots of strokes per minute. You've got to find something that's going to take you over the middle of the course. Very impressed with a start by Oxford. Again, a long, long way to go. And it doesn't mean everything, but the dark blues have got out to a very strong start. Cambridge are favoured to win this, and they're pretty strong favourites as well but at the moment oxford in a decent position but you can see the waters just starting to creep almost up and splashing those in the bow seats and again as they come around this new stand this very impressive new stand of craven cottage and they turn more towards the north they'll be into that headwind it'll be against the tide which is going with the crews at the moment and that coming together of wind and tide will create a bit of chop we can see here, if you look at the very end of the boat, the, the forward part of the boat, quite often when crews think it's going to be rough, they put a little deck on to actually push some of the spray out. doesn't look certainly like Cambridge have done that, so maybe they're thinking that this rougher weather won't last as long as, as we thought. Yeah, it's all about sort of assessing what you think the conditions are going to be and really play to those. And you can see it's pretty bouncy, but not 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 too bad at the moment but it's it's going to be when they start to turn this bend where, then you'll get to see it let's just listen in for a moment to the coxes you can hear james trotman the cambridge cox and just listen to the instructions and the sound of the boats Ready? Let me show you that uh, the heart rate of the cops has even got to the 140s from a resting of 59. That shows that they're feeling attention as well. For the first time in the race, the blades are getting closer to the two crews. Yeah, they'll be feeling that as well. And I think the Cambridge crew is starting to, to edge back up. And once you get that bit of momentum, it, it gives you this, this second burst of energy. And I think there's nothing more motivating if a crew jumps out on you than being able to walk back up. And that, that they'll know that Oxford has the inside bend at the moment. But soon, very soon, it's going to be coming back to, to Cambridge favouring their own bend. And it was interesting listening to James Trotman, the cops of the Cambridge crew there, because he did sound very calm. He didn't sound worried about being a little bit down. And Oxford have now used up that little bit of advantage they had at the start. And like you say, Grace, now it's Cambridge's turn. Well, that first bend is worth about a quarter of a length to the crew on the Middlesex station, which is Oxford in this. And they have no advantage now as Cambridge start to move through. And when, I suppose, Grace, you're in a boat like that and you can feel yourself moving past your opposite number, that really does give you such a boost. It really does. And they'll all be able to see it out of the corner of their eye. So it doesn't even need to be communicated. But then 
they'll know they're, they're slowly moving up seat by seat by seat and it just it's there's literally actually just not a better feeling and, and i think when they also know they're about to get an advantage they will be a hard crew to stop now and this is probably a really important phase for oxford to stop that heading past the familiar sights of the boat race on the left the barnes wetlands and still heading all straight north here. The river really does loop around. It's no straight east to west race, but you can see the advantage. The Cambridge have pulled out in the last two minutes. They have put on a, a big push, and the crowds again gathering in their hundreds and thousands in the banks, watching on as the women have raced here on the championship course since 2015 and putting on a show. But I think what's interesting, if you look at the crews, we see Oxford now on the screen. They look quite relaxed. Their shoulders look like they've dropped down they look like they're you know they're pushing their legs well they don't look like they're having to work really hard here whereas Cambridge have really put in a lot to get up into this position first instructions from Matt Smith I was chatting to him before and he said I want to be saying nothing at all in the race I want it to be quiet and whereas I said we as commentators and viewers want something very different but the first warning to both crews to pull apart there I thought Cambridge really did seem to be creeping across well Matt Smith no stranger to an exciting race but that's from the athletes perspective he was in the crew in 2001 where there was a restart and not forgetting 20 years ago that incredible one foot win Cambridge warned there to get back towards the, the left back towards the Surrey station they just crept across a little bit once you get clear water there's James Trump and you can see his hands just delicate hold on the rudder wires that steer the boat and listen in Now, if Cambridge were able to get clear water, they could choose whichever station they wanted. They could control the river. But then if Oxford were to re-establish contact, you could almost get a disqualification. So Cambridge are being warned again, and this is bold cock taking from James Trotman. Oxford haven't lost touch. Look, what is that? A few feet of clear water? It is bold coxing considering how close the crews are together and I think the, the Cambridge rowers are gonna really have to back up their coxin at the moment and make sure they keep moving. And, and Oxford are moving now. Actually you heard you heard Thomas Slade in the Oxford boat shoot called a massive push there. And they are going for it. They know this is a do or die moment, Oxford. And Cambridge have got to move or they are in trouble. Serious trouble. Well, if Oxford can bump Cambridge you know, you could have disqualifications in a scenario like that. So Cambridge have to move back to the Middlesex station. And they are moving now. But that touch of the rudder, that's break on a boat as well. So that's a big push by Oxford. But how much will it cost them? And, and you can see the panic start to kind of creep in on the face of Queever and stroke seat on the Cambridge crew. You can, I think she was very aware of how close Oxford was. And they put in a good move to be like, if you're going to cut in front of us, we will make you pay for it. And that's exactly what you've got to do in a one-on-one -on -one race when you are a length down. You can't let the boat, you can't lose contact. You've got to stay with it. I thought for a second we might be having an Oxford-Cambridge bumps race on our hands. <laughs> I think I've been saying that Cambridge have to move towards yeah, Middlesex. It is, of course, Surrey on the south side. And now this big Surrey bend is a huge loop of the river. Now this is worth three quarters of a length to the boat in the Surrey station, so to Middlesex, and, and so to Cambridge. And look at the gap they've suddenly pulled out. So we talked about that effort that Oxford had made to re-establish contact. But again, that is energy spent. It was a, it's a lot of energy so spent, and not only in the no physical, contact. but it's mental. They, they knew they had to do something then and there, and they responded, but it does look now like they're now paying for it. There's a, a familiar heads if you know something else. Dave Catherine Grange and Kyra as well, and Casa watching on as they come past with so many of the, the crowds here that gather on that north bank there with all the pubs of Hammersmith. But, Again, in the last minute, Cambridge have really taken control of this race. Yeah, I mean, after that move from Oxford, I think you're right. They had to put a lot into that. But it was the right thing to do, because ultimately, if they could have even touched the Cambridge boat, that could have been game over for Cambridge. And it looked like they were centimetres away from doing that, and a little bit of luck on, on maybe Cambridge's side that they didn't, didn't get hit. But, um, they seem to be now capitalising and, and they've recognised that now's the time to keep moving. And there, look at that picture. That's an example of what the wind can do to a river because now, as they start to come around and they're more sheltered, or they, they'll start to get it almost as a tailwind. It calms things down. So it's going to be plain or sailing quite often when you come into Chiswick Reach here and towards the Chiswick Gate. 
this is when the waters chop up because you'll be heading southwesterly. Just let's listen to Tara Slade here. Just because I, the dynamic of a cox that knows they're a long way behind, what do you say to your crew? You've got to be realistic, but you've got to stay positive at the same time, and it's ultimately, it's probably the hardest thing that you've got to do in that position, because you can't just say, this is game over, and you can hear what she's saying, she's saying, they went too hard, we, we, we're still in with a chance, and that's exactly, that's exactly what I would be doing, I think that's the, that's the only thing you can do, really. It is, and that's the, that's the toughest thing about this race, is once you're behind, you cannot see anyone, and you need to listen to your cops and trust that they, they know what's happening in front of you, and it's a do-or-die moment, and you just have to go with that. Over halfway now, and there's a new halfway post in there in the grounds of St Paul's School, and they'll come past it now and out to a, well, an enormous lead now for Cambridge, and as the waters calm down, they hope very much that it is going to be the plain sailing from now on as Cambridge look to extend this dominance. So Oxford just have to dig in, and this is where, again, we've talked about it before, the Cox almost has to lie to the crew and say, yes, they're not going anywhere, they're not getting away from me, even if that isn't quite the truth. It's such a fine balance, isn't it? Because you need to keep the trust of your crew, but equally they're going to be aware. It's really subtle things. You know, if you're in a boat that's behind, you can't see them, but you can see the disturbance of the water from their blades slowly starting to edge away. So you do know that something is changing. And, and again, you can feel it when you come back to them. It feels a bit bumpier. That's, you know, that's how you know that you're moving back towards a crew. So look at Matt Smith now. He's put his flags away. He's just enjoying being at the head of this flotilla. <laughs> Enjoying the the trip down the Thames as we look down and the giant insects that creep up the water there. It's a beautiful sight and a familiar sight, but that is a big, big gap between Cambridge and Oxford, and they are surely heading to victory. Still a long, long way to go, and still much can happen, but this Cambridge crew is uh, an impressive one. Not quite of the calibre of last year. That was a different feel to that boat, as it was for the, K uh, the Oxford boat as well, but... My goodness, they've come together well here. And again, Oxford just have to persevere and say, we've trained so hard for this, we're not going to go gently. Yeah, and Cambridge has the luxury now that they can sit out in front. All, all eight rowers can see the Oxford crew behind them. And you can start relaxing, and, and everything sort of seems to come a little bit easier, which is a very privileged position. I mean, you say easier, but we can see Quiver Dempsey's heart rate there is 178, which is two to three times what those sitting at home watching is going to be right now so she's still working very hard to put her crew out there in front but yeah she'll be she'll be working very hard and i think you don't realize in a race like this the rowers are in an immense amount of pain from probably from about 60 to 90 seconds in and they have to be comfortable being that uncomfortable for almost 20 minutes it's 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 tough, it's tough, and that's part of long-distance racing, is figuring out who can be uncomfortable the longest. And, you know, you can compare it to championship racing, which is over two-kilometre courses, and, and here, you know, in kilometre terms, 6.8 kilometres, it's a very different feel. It is a very different feel, and, and you saw it in the start of this race, you have to go harder than you want to go at the start, because you don't want to get behind, so... The nature of that means you're going to be in pain very early on. It's interesting. James Trotman just looking around, seeing where are we in the in the river. We're in a very good position. And again, Tana Slade saying, you're going to have them. And again, that's the, the kidology that you have to adopt at times, because I don't think the lead has stretched out too much further, but it's it's simply unbridgeable as they come to the crossing. There still is a long way to go, and looking at the stroke there, Esther Austin, the New Zealander, the most uh, experienced, the only one over 30 in the boat. But as the, the horn sounds, you see the wash of the river behind from the flotilla, battering off the walls and the crowd have come to watch this and the race to come as well so it is staying at about that same distance and Oxford are doing all they have to do in, in sort of trying to keep pace but it's impossible to see a way back from here it's tough I think they'll just be wanting to keep the pressure on and hopefully 
the make the Cambridge crew feel uncomfortable enough that maybe a little mistake will, will slip in and, and maybe they've gone too hard and the fatigue will make something happen and this is what they've trained for all season so they're not going to give up lightly. Let me take you through the Cambridge boats, Karina Graf in the bow seat and then Rosa Millard, Alex Riddle, Webster there and Jenna Armstrong, the American just going out of shot, another American, Freya Quito and then another and Isabel Bastien, Brelon, the Canadian, the internationalist just behind Piva Dempsey in the stroke seat, who is the only one with experience of the boat race, of being in a blue boat. And there is Barnes Bridge now creeping into view. So they know they're into, if not quite the final stages, because all the way around the you bend there, you can see Chiswick like Bridge, which is where line. they will finish. Still some way to go, but they know they're into the final third of the race. I think this is really where that suffering aspect really comes into this. It's like you said, Grace, it's such a tough race physically. It's three times the length of an Olympic race. And that suffering is really brought to the forefront by this media attention, which ultimately, you know, you've, you've been to the Olympics. Even the most elite rowers in the world don't get the chance to perform in front of this kind of crowd. No, and on TV and, and along the banks, you are racing this race, and it is a long-distance race, and you have people continually cheering for you exactly. and watching you along the bank. And, that adds a lot of excitement, but a lot of pressure as well. But ultimately, this is the thing, right? If the cameras were all switched off and nobody turned up on the bank, these 18 athletes would still be out here doing this exact same thing. Well, I always said of the men's race and now the women's race, it's a private match for public consumption and the public do come to consume it again. You can see, I was wondering with the weather today, if they were going to come out in numbers, and they have in thousands again. As James Trotman now just cruising along with with Cambridge, his crew have put in a huge effort here as they come around to shoot the central span of Barnesbridge. One of the one of the rules of the boat race, Hammersmith and Barnesbridge, is shoot the central spans. And again, the gap, the lead remains the same, if not creeping out even further. So for Oxford, it is a lost cause in terms of winning the race, but again, still competing for their own pride. And their time. Nice rhythm, says James Trotman, as it has been throughout from this light blue crew. And he says other things as well. So apologies if you heard that. It's been so good until this point, James. It's one, one way to motivate your crew, but he'll, he'll be relishing in this. So coming, coming around this last bend, and you, you don't know. You, you spend this whole season training, but you have not had the opportunity to race Oxford or Cambridge. But there you can see a big gap extending out. It is a big gap, but it's not its not gone away as much as it, it might have. Oxford have dug in pretty well. I think this is actually a really impressive performance from this Oxford crew. They are much more of a sort of homegrown talent, I guess. You know, three, three legs a row at Oxford, one at Cambridge. On paper, a weaker crew, I guess, but they've built this real family feeling and they just through everything they had at Cambridge. You know, when you look down from on high and you see the boats moving in such a serene fashion, and then you see the close-up of the faces and you see the effort, and it is writ large on the faces of the Cambridge crew who are dominating this race. But, you know, you've been there, Grace, you know how hard it is. And I think it's really interesting, it always feels closer as, as a rowlet. They will be still so uncomfortable, and you can see it on those faces. There is so much hard work going in, and they will be counting down the strokes to the line. And the landmarks remain the same, the brewery of Mortlake in the distance, and then they keep coming round the bend, and then there's a straight of about three, four hundred metres towards the finish, just shy of Chiswick Bridge. Duke's Meadow on the right-hand side, Barnes to the left, and the placid waters of the Thames now, and Cambridge continue, continue to race without letting up, as you can't let up in the in the boat race. And the Cox will ask for a final effort to take them to the finish line and to another victory. Yeah, they've done well, well to hold on to their streak, and often that adds a lot of pressure and a, a lot of extra expectations. But the, the Cambridge crew have been able to really rise to the occasion today.
It's a word for the Oxford crew it. I, I, as we I, take I, you down I that boat. Laurel Kay, the American in the bow seat, and no. Ella Stadler in two, Sarah Helene, the president, in three, then Freya Willis, the Australian, Alison Carrington, Claire Aiken, for Aiken from uh, Oxford in Persia, Sarah Marshall, Esther Austin, we saw in the stroke seat, and, and Tara Slade, the Cox. Again, that gap hasn't shrunk, it hasn't grown. It has been Cambridge keeping Oxford at bay and Chiswick Bridge is drawing nearer. And you can hear Tara slight slate there, the Oxford Cox, she's talking about pride six months, every early morning, every session. And that's the same, obviously, for all 18 athletes in this boat. But what Cambridge have done here, they're about to take a sixth win in a row. And I don't think that's something that you can look past. You really can't, but you do. You've got to think of these crews. Both crews have put in just as much work and time. That we're coming up to the line, and, and, and someone has to win and someone has to lose, and that's the ruthless nature of sport. The final few pulls on the oar for Cambridge as they come towards victories once more. Six in a row now for the light blues, and the recent story of the women's boat race tells of Cambridge dominance, and now they can ease down, now they can relax, and now they can smile and celebrate. And you hear the roars and the cheers, and you see the gap as Oxford come through second place. But second, as they know, is nowhere in the boat race. It is cruel and unforgiving. It is everything and nothing, and Cambridge have it all this year. They have it all again. Steady on, James. That was an impressive effort. An impressive effort from Cambridge. Yes! And again, you have to say an impressive effort from Oxford. Tara Slade's got her hand up. I'm not sure well, the protest will go back to when James Trotman. So you see the hip hip raise here, you hear them. But Tara Slade has her hand up. She's going to object. I think it's. Uh, well, Zoe, what do you think? I can see where she's coming from, but I think ultimately it didn't change the outcome of the race. They did, but there was no contact. That is the uh, responsibility of a Cox. All Coxies will, if there was something close like that, you will protest. But I think, as you heard Matt Smith, they say fight, there was no girls. contact. Good fight, guys, says Esther Austin. But there was no contact. So if there had been contact when James Trotman steered Cambridge across, then that would have been a very different matter. And this is one of the things about the boat race. There are very, very few rules, and a lot of it is left to, to the discretion of the umpire. But ultimately, unless there's contact, you can't really argue a foul. And without that, if the race had been closer, then maybe you could have argued that that was very disruptive and etc. But Cambridge rode away with such, um, just so imperious, really, after that, that Actually, I think it would be hard to argue that that did change the outcome of the race. Six in a row now in the women's race. And it's interesting when you talk about the the, the women's crews and the lightweights and everything being integrated at Cambridge, and they've come together as one club, and they have their new boathouse, which actually coincides almost with the start of their period of dominance, so that all the crews are working there at Ely together. I'm sure that's not coincidence. There's a Cambridge juggernaut at the moment, which ultimately... There have been no Oxford wins so far this year. The lightweights, the veterans, the spares, and now, obviously, this race we've just watched. It's difficult to see past that at the moment, and obviously, success begets success. It all builds on the year before. That's quite impressive from James Trotman. A, a, a rowing boat is not a stable thing. It's, uh, that could easily have ended in Trotman down. A soggy end to your boat race win. Trotman overboard, but uh, the protest by... Tara Slade in Oxford has been explained away and dismissed by Matt Smith, the umpire, and it is victory for Cambridge again. I think they're just... So James Trotman asking to see the white flag there. He wants... So there we are, victory again for Cambridge. Six in a row in the women's boat race. Well, the crew just turning their heads towards Chiswick Bridge. Well, they're just looking towards Chiswick Bridge, just, uh, I think, waiting for final confirmation of that result. But what an emphatic performance from the Cambridge crew. We can see 
the Oxford crew just in the background racing away. And that looks like confirmation there. Smiles all round, fists in the air. So Cambridge officially then winning that 77th women's boat race. And now the tears begin to flow. James Trotman, the Cox, just uh, putting his thumbs up. And he'll now navigate his crew back to the bank. You can't even see the... Uh, the exertion they put through their legs in this moment of victory. That is the binary nature of the boat race. It's elation versus devastation. We'll just run you through that crew again. James Trotman then, the Cox, the youngest competitor in this year's boat race, just 18 years old. Now getting applauded from the uh, from the banks, from Mortlake, Anglian and Alpha Boat Club, where they will make their final resting stop of the day in the stroke seat. Then Kruva Dempsey, the only returning blue this year, the president, Claire Brion, Canadian, the only international athlete competing on boat race day of 2023, sitting in seven. Isabel Bastian of the US in the sixth seat. Freya Quito, another US of St. Edmunds College, Cambridge, sitting in the five seat. Jenna Armstrong just behind her. Alex Riddle-Webster, who knows this bit of the river so well. She's uh, learning to row, learn to row at Godolphin and Latimer Boat Club. Then we've got Rosa Millard in the two seats and Karina Graf of Germany in the bow who will start to tapping the boat along into the uh, final spot where they'll be assisted out. And we've got Oxford just behind them as well. A moment of contemplation there. It was such an impressive start from the Oxford crew down towards Putney Bridge. They started on the Middlesex bank. It's the side that has that initial advantage in the first few moments of the boat race. It was choppy, the waters around uh, that area into Craven Cottage by Fulham Reach. They were rowing into a, a headwind at that point, and that's when Oxford really were trying to assert some authority at the start of the race. But ahead of this, we talked about how impressive came Cambridge had been over the last few years and they moved through past Barnes, the wetland center. They were first to the mile post and then into Hammersmith. They just began to move away. There was that tense moment though, the big push from Oxford and there was an appeal at the end, but no touching between the crews, no contact and Cambridge safely onto victory. And now they are going to make their way out of the boat and you can see alumni standing on the banks ready to greet them, including Imogen Grant, a world champion. She was part of the 2020 crew last year. They got bottles of champagne. Quiva Dempsey now makes contact on the land and you can only imagine how much pain those legs are feeling, but she won't be thinking about that right now. And they make their way to friends, to family. The rain still staying away, which is what we want to see on boat race day, but overcast skies. So we we'll hope that holds out for the men's race, which is going to take place in just over half an hour's time. But six in a row now for Cambridge. There's James Trotman just in the front of your picture, 18 years old, just puts away his equipment. You've got to feel for the Coxes. It must be a chilly place to be on a day like this steering your boat but we saw his heart rate up at 149 during the race so he's working hard as well I checked mine at that point as well on my smartwatch and mine was at 100 so uh, not just for the crews it's for those watching as well I wonder how you're feeling at home so hugs all around we're gonna hear from the winning president from the winning head coach in just a couple of moments time but this is Cambridge winning the women's boat race the 77th edition they've been racing on this same course as the men since 2015 and now Lee McKenzie Quiva Dempsey who's got one champagne bottle in her hand and the other on the ground oh Quiva just try and sum up the emotions <laughs> I genuinely haven't caught my breath um that was just such a whirlwind of a, of a race there was so much going on the conditions 
changed so much from start to finish. There was, it's just, I'm so proud. It's a completely different experience as a president, um, and it's a completely different experience sitting in stroke seat. And I just, yeah, it's still sinking in honestly. But I'm just so proud of the girls. They handled, they, that was a tough race. There was so much going on, and they handled it so well. They're just so tenacious and strong and brave. And and a full credit to Oxford. They raced an amazing race. They really didn't let us go, and they had an amazing start, and they handled the conditions so well. So yeah, it's just such an amazing thing to be a part of. They put you under pressure right from the start but it got a little bit interesting at Hammersmith Bridge didn't it? Oh yeah I mean that's the nature of the boat race right that's what's what makes it so exciting is that there's so much tactics to play as a cox um, and yeah I mean J J James went for it he's he's um, he he's competitive. Quiva from your point of view you know you said as you know the only returning blue in your boat that you thought you'd have to share your experience but in actual fact you learn an awful lot. This is a really special group, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Honestly, I mean, yeah, like you, you said, I'm the only person here from last year's crew, so I did feel a pressure, but, but genuinely, all of these girls bring something so different to the crew. We've got girls from loads of different programs, international experiences, and such different approaches to racing, and, and girls that just have the fun and the love of rowing still, um, which is something that not, I don't always have 10 years into the sport, so it's, it's been such a pleasure. We are huge congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, but the highs and lows of sport mean uh, that there's going to be a, a slightly disappointed, I think it's fair to say, Sarah Helene. Um, my goodness, you must be so proud, though, of how your girls all perform, because, my goodness, from the very start, you put Cambridge under pressure. Yeah, I'm so proud of the girls. We put up a really good fight, and I think we can be really proud of that. The tactics in the middle as well, round about Hammersmith Bridge, and then we saw that there was a question about whether to protest or not. Did you feel you had a chance? Yeah, I mean, you never know what's going to happen, and I can't really see. I'm just listening to my cox tower and doing everything she says. So, but in terms of the conditions out there, um, you know, how, how difficult was it always going to be against a very strong Cambridge side? and everything that's going on out there today because we saw it getting quite choppy at times. Yeah, I think the craziest thing was it changed so much over the course so you never knew what was coming next. Okay, listen, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you very much. Sarah Helene there, the losing president of the Oxford women's crew. And we just see that they are having a moment on the bank now, but it's a tough... Tough world, the world of boat race racing. A win for Cambridge, a loss for Oxford. And as we let that settle, the men's race coming up in just under half an hour's time. So we're going to start to build up towards that now. Can Cambridge make it a clean sweep? It's the 168th time Oxford and Cambridge will battle it out for top honours on the iconic or iconic but unpredictable waters of the tideway uh, but the pre boat race fixtures suggest the two crews might be fairly evenly matched this year we've got a little less international racing experience than last year though we've got four returning blues in each boat uh, both losing to oxford brooks by similar amounts when they raced uh, against some of the brooks crews just a couple of weeks ago now once again this year Gemini are sponsoring the event, sponsoring the boat race. The company was founded by the Winklevoss twins, Tyler and Cameron, both Olympic rowers with the USA and both former blues themselves wearing the dark blue of Oxford in 2010. And they're keen to partner up with this iconic event and help rowing grow. Rowing is a very magical sport and it's, it's really the greatest teacher uh, we off, I often say that um, some of the best lessons in life I learned at the boathouse and they had little, if anything, to do with rowing. People learn so much through the sport, how to work on teams, work hard, set goals, all those incredible life lessons. And so we're very passionate about increasing access to the sport and allowing as many people to step foot into a boathouse as possible. You know, our journey started with our ability to walk into a boathouse, take our first stroke. Um, so like Cameron said, the sport is so magical. It's such a great teacher. We want to spread the sport. And that starts with increasing the access, the funnels, the pipelines into it. And then the rest will follow, whether it's one season as a rower or you go all the way to Olympics or multiple Olympics. The sport is a profound teacher. It has a pr profound impact on lives, and we, we're passionate about growing and spreading that. It's a, a great evolution of the event, and it makes for a much more complete and exciting day to bring the men and the women together. 
both teams have have athletes at, at a very high caliber um, at the highest level. So to, to see that level of racing um, is, is really great. It's great for the boat race. It's great for the athletes. It's great for the fans. There's more high caliber racing. Um, so it's, it's overall a, a win-win huge net positive for, for the boat race and the event. So those are the Winklevoss twins, part of the losing boat in 2020, 2010, sorry, with Oxford. But as part of the training and selection towards who lines up in the cruise we see today, the clubs have their trial eights races in December. It's the only opportunity they have to race the full championship course under the gaze of the official race umpire. So let's go back to the Oxford men's contest. The two crews named Beetle and Wedge. That's after a restaurant near where they train. Watching for us, Martin Cross and Phelan Hill. Here we go. Good clean first stroke from yep. both crews. So they're winding through their paces, going up to above there 40. You go. I, think, I think Beetle have gone out very good first few strokes there. So that's the crew of Middlesex on the right of your picture they seem to have a lead and Beetle is being warned by Tony Reynolds we saw this in the women's boat race but he's got the flag you can see his white flag out in front of the camera and he's saying Beetle you should be on the other side of the picture I can tell you now looking out the window that Beetle the crew on the far side have just under a canvas lead you can see the shot there there it is they're passing right in front of us great start both crews that's what you want Louis Corrigan's going really close, isn't he? The uh, Cox of Beetle on that right-hand side. He's being yeah. warned. He's gone really close. He's trying to push over, but uh, he'll feel that's just desserts after what uh, Tobias Berner did to him earlier in the race. And he's called again. Look at Beetle steering. They're clashing again. They're clashing again. He's telling Wedge to move over. He's telling Beetle to move over. I do think they're just edging away up in the bows. That's William Loosley, Colson Andrews, the Yank in the two seat, Alfred Orgin from uh, Britain in the three seat, Johnny Davison putting in a four. You can see his blade really biting there. Jan Ola Ernst, the big five man in Beetle on the right of your oh, picture. Oh, Tom Sharrock. Oh, he's crab. lost his blade. He's oh, lost no, it he's lost it. Oh, look at that. And they're bashing the boat in, in exasperation. That's the three man, Nick Elkington. Did you see him smack the blade in exasperation yeah, there? A win for Beetle just coming up to the line. Loosely, Andrews, Orkin, Davison, Ernst, Sharrock. Von Mueller, you can hear what it means to them. Bed in stroke seat, Cox by Louis Corrigan. So that was a taste of the Oxford Trial 8s back in December. Let's see how Cambridge got on. The boats named Youth and Experience. Camilla Hadland Horrocks and Grace Prendergast were watching. So we are about to get underway. And we are away. Both clean, but on, on the start day, you have to, you can't square your blade in the water because there is so much current running up, running along. Yeah. Looks yeah. like both crews have had clean slot yeah. starts. Yeah, yes. although I must say, Jasper Parrish's crew, the one on the right, uh, going slightly more towards Ollie Boyne's crew, the uh, experienced crew trying to hold their line as youth comes all the way across to try and put pressure on them. And it is just uh, inching ever closer here uh, with this crew from for experience on the inside of the bends they are um, really utilizing the last bit of their leg drive quite well there's a real uh, again intentional kind of press through that body swing through the last bit of the leg drive and i think that's what's gaining them that little bit of ground every time uh, on the crew from youth well, a, a much bigger sort of gap at this point between the men's crews than there was between the women's crews, but it's still, you know, not unattainable here for experience. Just a length or so separating uh, youth who are, we've got on screen now in the lead. That they've just looked that little bit more composed, I must say, Grace. Through most of this race, you can see the faces, um, which 
if you can keep that relaxed, if you can keep all of this above the shoulders nice and relaxed, the, the likelihood is that will keep transferring down to your limbs uh, and everything else too. So it's been youth that has led the whole way on the far side of your screen and I think it's going to be youth that's going to get to that famous finish post first. The white flag goes up from the umpire and the Tinfish. Two seats there to youth over experience. It's the young guns uh, that take the crown this time around and uh, all absolutely exhausted. But a big thumbs up there from the, uh, the stroke seat, Luca Ferrero, to the other crew. Uh, what a fantastic race. So we've seen Cambridge's women already winning the boat race in style. The 77th women's boat race. Can the men do the same? The crews are out on the water now, warming up. We had the coin toss earlier to decide which banks they will start on. Cambridge called heads. It came down as tails. So Oxford have chosen to start on the Surrey side, same as the Cambridge women. Now we were having a little look at those trial eights from back in December. It was time for the squads to battle against one another. It was all leading up to today. And today's racing, of course, comes off half a year's worth of hard training. They've got to bad, uh, balance studies as well, living life as a student in either of these ancient institutions. So let's head to Cambridge and join Seb Bensacree and the rest of the light blues to glimpse a little bit of what it takes to get to the start line. This year's boat race should be really good, actually, because it's very much a kind of classic student boat race. You know what I mean? There aren't, there aren't sort of big internationals coming in, um, you know, post-Olympics. Yeah, I mean, we have no senior internationals. We have some U23s. Um, but it really feels like, you know, a young kind of relatively unknown group of rowers. That inexperience is not necessarily a bad thing in this case, I think. Like the, the just the raw like excitement and fun we've got on the crew is something that we didn't quite get right last year. Like more of just raw excitement, more sort of the studenty, excited vibe, which leads to sort of more raciness. The thing about our crew is it's the crew I trust most in the last thousand meters. You know, we were really lucky to have a really good close trial eights. You know where it came right down to the line. Um, you know, and I think if you go into the race expecting something like that, so you're ready to work all the way. Every single guy in the boat is a racer, um, <clears throat> and exactly the kind of people I would trust in a close boat race. Because it's a young group and they're less experienced, you've got to do everything really with them in a, to a degree. You know, you've got to build their resilience, build up some of the mental aptitudes that we need to, to win the boat race. Technically, you know, we've got to get them working the way we want them, rowing well. And of course, we've got to build fit, strong, robust rowers that can withstand the boat race. Uh, we didn't really row together at all until, until about September last year. We did a few outings before that, but basically we'd never been on the same boat before. Sit, fluid over the knees, that's it. That's all the organisation I wanted here. We kind of just get each other quite well, you know, yeah. we can pick up on the yeah. really subtle cues. I think it's a mood thing, it's sort of like... A mood thing as well. We can quite quickly yeah. tell who's, like, if one of us is maybe not enjoying the rhythm as much as the other or the other way around. He's low. Yeah. I've probably avoided putting them together too much through the year because uh, I think it's important that they have their own independence and they're not just blocked together. But in the end, you know, it's quite a powerful combination. Um, Jasper's grown up a hell of a lot in the last year and a half with us and, and, and Cots and the women's team last year. You know, I think it's going to be a, an important partnership for the, for, the, for the crew. The smoothness will come, the timing will come, but we need to stay on this and not deviate. Okay. I was born in Paris, then I moved to the suburbs of Paris, went to study in London, uh, at Imperial for four years, and now I'm here in Cambridge. We do 12 sessions a week. Uh, most of them are uh, quite long ergs um, or long water sessions. And so what's tough is not really the intensity of the sessions, even though we do quite, uh, quite intense sessions, obviously, but is the fact that you have to do so many long sessions back to back and uh, sometimes you do, for example, two sessions in the morning and then you have to get back to work in the afternoon. And I feel like this really hits you uh, 
like you you can get pretty pretty intensely tired uh, when you do such long sessions. Um, I think yeah, that's the main that's the main difficulty maybe. Can I have the lasagna with broccoli and the chips? Please. Somehow you manage to squeeze everything in. Uh, I guess it's pretty easy this year because I'm living in college, so. I can just have lunch for dinner with my friends because they're also in college. We don't really know how fast Oxford are and they certainly don't know how fast we are, I don't think. But I think it should probably be quite well matched. Ultimately, they've got to do what they do in training, you know, on race day, that's the challenge. I think you should always expect close races, but you know, I'm, I'm happy in the crew I'm with. And I, I think we can pull it out. I don't think that many people could beat me power-wise uh, off the start. So that's definitely something I will try to demonstrate uh, on the day of the boat race. And I'm sure that that will bring something significant to the crew. Essentially, I've got, I've got full power on the boat and I'm, I'm very willing to use it when we need to. Um, which means potentially changing race plan mid-race if we have to. If I have to make the call, I will make the call and we will, we will do what we have to do to win this. So 15 minutes to go until the men's boat race. And we are looking at Putney Embankment right now, filling up nicely. The rain has stayed away. I'm sure I can see a little hint of blue sky as well and shades of light and dark blue everywhere you look. Now, we saw the set of brothers there involved in this year's boat race. Jasper Parrish, the cox of the Cambridge boat. His older brother, Ollie Parrish, will be sitting in the seventh seat. And it was a similar story for the Winklevoss twins. They've done everything together, including losing a boat race with Oxford back in 2010. We really were excited to participate in, in the storied event um, and felt like we really wanted to do it together as teammates. That was just really important to, to go through that experience together. Um, we've been teammates for so many years and it felt like this experience we just had to do together. And so it was incredibly meaningful to, to share all of that together and, and be a part of it. We both went to Oxford, but we should have maybe split up. That would have been kind of fun. One goes to Cambridge, one goes to Oxford. Then we would have guaranteed one of us would have won. As it turned out, we both chose Oxford. Unfortunately, we came up uh, short that year, so neither one would have won, but it would have been a fun experiment in a different life. Oxford is such an incredible institution, but also rowing has such a sort of story tradition. Um, so it felt like in our rowing journey that that was something we really wanted to try um, and that it would be, you know, somewhat incomplete if we hadn't, you know, done, done Oxford and, and, and rowed in the boat race. So we we're really excited to try that. Being a blue is a huge honor. We actually did the boat race after being Olympians. We still felt there was more unfinished business, more to do in the sport. And the boat race was part of that. So it's a world-class event with world-class athletes. Um, there's a huge mystique in tradition and we wanted to be a part of that. And a nice overhead shot there of the Cambridge crew just going through their final preparations. Jasper Parrish watching his crew and giving them their final orders. But our focus now is Oxford. They were the champions a year ago on this stretch of water on the Tideway. And they'll be starting from there, from the Putney Embankment in just a moment's time. Can they repeat the feat again today in 2023? Well, let's check in with the crew and see how they fared in the build-up to the race. I've grown up in Cambridge all my life, but um, I went to a state secondary school, so we didn't have a boat club or our own river or anything like that, like a lot of a lot, a lot of other rowers had growing up. It was just a sit former at the school ran an indoor rowing club once a week, so we had a few rowing machines that have a bit of fun on them, and I and also realised I was relatively good at it. And from there, I mean, it was joining the local rowing club in, in the town. That's probably what set me up to become a rower today and be able to be successful. I've never been in a club with such a strong focus on just one race um, 
and to be in a crew like that is really different to anything I've ever sort of experienced. Um, and to be in another country as well just makes it even more special to me. It's hard on two fronts. It's hard enough to get into the university and that was always a, 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 big, a big challenge, right? Just getting in the first place is incredibly tough these days and then you have to be good enough to actually make the blue boat. And to manage to do both of those, I'm really proud to have done. Certainly when you're looking at a race that you definitely feel that you know, you're probably not going to get away easily and it's going to be close for a long time, yes, you definitely have to look at the way you train and the, the, the kind of psychology behind preparing people for those situations. I'm in charge of the boat. If the boys don't listen to me, that's, that's a problem. So um, I, I really need to be confident, especially as a female coxswain of eight boys. You, you have to demand a bit of respect. Certainly you'd like a cox who can sense that winning moment and act decisively. Um, but at the same time, you want coxes who don't put their crew at risk. My mum's a doctor, my brother's a doctor, and I've always been interested in medicine and healthcare generally. So I'm doing an MRes uh, neuroscience. Uh, I'm essentially trying to uh, research motor neuron disease. Part of what I'm doing is um, using stem cells taken from patients with the disease, growing those stem cells into motor neurons and separately growing muscle fibres. I find my lab works very busy and it can be quite stressful at times. I work with living cells and sometimes they do just die without you knowing why. And at those days it's really nice to be able to go to training, have good 10, 15, 20 mates that you can chat to and they'll give me a bit of grief about my cells dying again and I'll explain why and then they'll sympathise and then you have a really nice support network there because you know it's very hard to maintain a social life, um, the work in the lab and then the training. I think the only way you can do it properly is if you make rowing a social activity for you as well, which you can enjoy. And then I think that's the way you get the best results as well. It's just, it is great to win, right? To be involved with pulling a team together and seeing that your best efforts are good enough to win. And that's, it's a tremendous experience to do that. That's the sort of thing you dream about when you're eight years old and you watch the race. You know, you see at the 270 bus down from Wandsworth down to Putney, stand on the bank, peer over the shoulders of someone much taller than me and try and see what they're doing as they go, go through the start line. I'm not going to remember individual nights out of my uni career. I'm going to remember being part of the boat race and winning the boat race. Having a bit of a plan for each situation is really important for a coxswain, just to be able to know, OK, this is the situation that I'm in, this is where I want to be, how am I going to get there, and how am I going to get the boys to respond to that? I'll do what it takes to get my boat across the line. <laughs> There's nothing to stop me being aggressive. So that was life on board with the Oxford men. A real sense of all the things these rowers do around their training as well. The studies that they are taking on at Oxford and at Cambridge. The boat race totally unique and it's interesting this year that the men's crews are not filled with international rowers. So perhaps really making it what the boat race is all about. So the tension is building. There is Putney Bridge. We can see the Cambridge crew coming through. Oxford over on the right hand side of your screen. They'll be heading towards the state boats in just a moment time. The crowds are building and for the crews, an immense amount of pain is on the way. 6.8 kilometres of gruelling rowing from Putney all the way through to Mortlake. So let's hear it from the Winklevoss twins again, the founders of Gemini, this year's sponsors. They know just how prepared you need to be to get here to the start line. The race plan is, I don't remember exactly, but it, it's its something that's simple, memorable in the heat of battle that you can stick to. Um, it's also something that's been being prepared for months and months. Um, we step into the uh, boathouse six months in advance before the race in the beginning of, let's say, September semester, and we're working backwards from race day all that time. Every Every scenario, variable has been thought out. We've trained, we've done trials. And I found that the, the simplest race plans are, are usually the best. 
we spend so much time preparing for this this race. Of course, there's certain things you just can't possibly prepare for. There's too many variables. Uh, to, but but I think we you know um, spent you know a ton of time uh, preparing for that. And the the day of you know I think you know we we have confidence in that. Um, and uh, so there's there's I think some reflection um, and 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 feeling that, okay, we've, we've done what we need to do. You know, we've done as much as we can to, to get to this point. And, and we have a race plan and try and, you know, execute as, as best as we can. And so it's as much as like on the race day, but also everything leading up to it. And I think you certainly feel like there's, there's no stone left unturned, so to speak. And they're going into it um, as well prepared as, as you can be. And so there's a lot of confidence and comfort in that um but of course it is race day and and anything can happen and then from there what i'll do is i'll give you this and you can put, unless you can talk to well them, that is the umpire the for the men's the race tony reynolds a former blue himself studied at a pgc at pembroke college yes, they are. and uh, he's umpired the azirus blondie race twice that was in 2020 and 2022 also umpired the Isis Goldie race in 2021. So he's making his final preparations. And there the megaphone comes out. You can hear five minutes, says Tony Reynolds, as the crews just in the background of your pitches start to get themselves aligned for the start of this race, the 168th men's boat race. And a reminder, we had the coin toss earlier. That is where the crews get to decide which bank of the Thames they can start on. There's advantages to both. The initial advantage on the middle sex side, so that would be the right-hand lower side of your picture, and then the Surrey side on the left. And Cambridge called heads, but it came down as tails. So Oxford chose the Surrey side, and this could be potentially quite tight. When you look at the racing fixtures that these crews were involved with before the boat race began. They race against other crews to see how they're doing, to see where their form is at. And they both raced Oxford Brooks, really the university in form in Europe at the moment. Both lost, but by some very similar margins. So will we see something quite tight here? So Oxford on the Surrey side, Cambridge there, Jasper Parish in the Cox's seat will be on the Middlesex bank. And he's one of a number of athletes actually in these two crews who has real tideway experience. Learned to row at St. Paul's school, which uh, they pass on the course as they go by, as did his older brother, Ollie Parrish, who's sitting in the seventh seat in Jasper Parish, you might remember last year, cocks the Cambridge women to resounding victory. So a win for him today. Well, it would be special, wouldn't it? Racing with your brother to a victory, but he could also become the youngest Cox to win both men's and women's races here in London. And the bank's filling up nicely now. That's the bow seat of the Oxford crew. James Forward, 20 years old from Pembroke College, studying PPE. And as our camera pans across the crew, we just see those final few little preparations taking place in the seven seat the president Tassilo von Müller German disappointed to miss out on blue boat selection last year but here he is will this be his moment and look at the edge of Putney Bridge there down on your picture how many people are aligning that buses going up and down the road will they stop and watch the start of this race. Now we know how incredibly important the start is. We saw that in the women's race only an hour ago when Oxford really took a charge on Cambridge, but ultimately Cambridge on the Surrey bank able to come through and really grapple control from Hammersmith Bridge onwards. So you can hear that buzz. The helicopters starting to whirl up in the air, the cameras taking it all in. So this is the 168th men's boat race. Currently, Cambridge wins 85, Oxford wins 81. Oxford are the defending champions from 2022. So it all boils down to this. They are on the state boats. 
And we're going to hand you over to our commentary team now. Matthew Holland, a winning Cox with Cambridge Women in 2017, with the men's crew in 2019, Zoe de Toledo, who coxed Oxford in 2012, and commentator Andrew Cotter. I think it was the first race to take place on a Sunday. It wasn't supposed to, but because of an incident involving the Cambridge boat, it happened on a Sunday, and we're here on a Sunday again, and Cambridge interested that they have become the slight favourites because most people would say that Oxford would start this one as slight favourites. And everything has been in light blue so far. The reserves, the lightweights, and the women's race was won by Cambridge, as we saw in impressive fashion. And here, Cambridge try and take Let's it back ready. from Oxford. Anthony Reynolds telling both crews to get ready. You know, nothing stays the same. New buildings on the backs, new faces in the boats, and sleek and modern shells that will skim across the water. But there's a constant about the boat race. The course from Mort Lake to Putney twists and turns as it did 150 years ago. Jasper Parrish, hands still up. As it is from Anna Hanlon, both coxes with their hands up. Not happy, perhaps, with the angle that they're pointing at at the moment. Cambridge. And it's very important that they get their pointing right on the start because you don't want to be using the rudder as this cruiser are getting into their rhythm. So both coxes with their hands up. Now Jasper Parrish puts his down. We're waiting then for Anna Hanlon from Sydney, the Australian who Attention. in control of this crew. And there's the red flag that drops under the guise of Tony Reynolds. And away they go. The latest, the newest page to be written in this old, old story. And again, both these crews have a tendency in the matches we've seen in the past few months, tendency to get out very, very fast indeed. And even in this angle, you can see them coming together. Cambridge being worn straight off the start there, and they thundered out of the start. They really went for it. But like you said right before the race, Matthew, with the rudder on now, not a good time to be steering. And now you can see Cambridge looking down from on high. You can see the bow, it starts to point towards the Middlesex station. And so they really have moved a little bit off to back towards the, the north bank to the Middlesex station. Now there's gap between the two, but in terms of who's in the lead, not much of a gap at all. Once again, the flag is up and the warning from Anthony Reynolds, Cambridge being warned. Cox Jasper Parrish is trying to get his crew right on their blade tip so they can feel the adrenaline, they can see exactly how much work they're having to put in to keep level with them. But it's a risky strategy because as you put that rudder on, as you get warmed, you make the crew nervous and the twitches can really affect your rhythm here. And I think it's interesting to see Tony Reynolds straight in there making these demands of the crews. He's usually a multi-lane umpire. He's quite a risk-averse guy. He does not want these crews anywhere near each other. Cambridge now being worn. We saw in uh, a couple of matches and the, when they raced against clubs, we saw Jasper Parrish is not averse to aggressive coxing. So too Anna Hanlon in the Oxford boat. And Oxford have Oxford. this heavier crew, the bigger crew, the taller crew, going into the headwind that might well suit them. And Cambridge Oxford. might take advantage later in the race. Now Oxford being worn, there is still enough clear water between the two crews. Tony Reynolds is being quite risk averse here, but I think it's with good reason given the performance of the crews in these fixtures. And you can see now the water, the wash that they're rowing in is really, really smacking the blades. You see lots of white water coming off the back end of their blades here, which is going to make the rhythm very difficult. Jasper is making a very, very, very bold move here. He's heading over towards the Craven Cottage. He's trying to get his crew clean water to row in and get their rhythm. I, I'm not sure that the water really warrants this kind of move. It's a bit rough, but it's nothing compared to what we'd often see, and actually now it looks like Anna O'Hanlon's following him over. Well, this is heading over towards the Fulham Flats, so Craven Cottage there. The Underneath the water, the Fulham Flats come out. It's very shallow water. Now, if you're looking for shelter, that's fine, but it's slack water, it's not fast water. The faster water is the deeper water, so that's a gamble by Cambridge. But my goodness, it's paid off, and you can see Oxford now creeping across. This is proving to be already one of the most fantastic boat races we've seen in the men's race here. And that's a half a length lead for Cambridge, and I think that was almost entirely down to Jasper Parrish's unbelievably bold move. I don't know, I think if Anna had stayed on the other side of the river, it might be different. I think the problem was she tried to follow him over there, and that means that now both crews are so far off their station. What's Tony Reynolds going to do about this now? I'm afraid I don't agree with you again. Look at the water that Oxford are rowing in here. They're well, let's get the view, Matthew, of Wayne Pommer, who's down on the water. What do you make of it so far, Wayne? 
Well, this is wild stuff. We have not seen steering like this in a boat race for years. Jasper Paris judging that the water was rough enough that he should head over to that full of wall for shelter. And I thought he was crazy, but it might have actually worked. And even now, Cambridge are in slightly better water than Oxford and are, are capitalizing on this. So I have not seen steering like this in years. Well, as we talked about in the in the women's race, that first bet into the Middlesex station, Cambridge in this race, is worth about a quarter of a length. But you can see they've taken out more than that. It's almost a length now, and beyond that, the angle again can sometimes be deceptive, but that is a big, big lead early on for Cambridge. Looking at the rhythms of the cruise, you can see just how smooth and relaxed Cambridge are rowing. They look like they're sliding forward towards the cock, slightly slower than Oxford, which is a good thing. That shows that they're relaxed, they're in control of their rhythm. Oxford, it looks slightly more frantic. They look like they're working a little bit harder to try and keep the boat flowing. Well, that's what Rob Baker, the Cambridge coach, always talks about. He wants to row really long and move the boat as far as possible with each stroke. They're the lighter crew. It's not a heavy crew at all. And the blonde hair there in the middle of the Cambridge boat, you've got Tom Lynch, who is big, six foot five, six. But apart from that, quite small rowers, but they're moving well. Now, this is when the power of Oxford, can they bite back into that and try and row into this lead? I think Oxford have, what we've seen from the fixtures is that Oxford had a slightly better base pace. Now, this is their bend coming up. This should be worth a length to them. Can they use this now? Can they be confident sitting down to stay on their rhythm? We see James Ford, the 20-year-old from Pembroke College in the bows of the Oxford boat, looking across. He's the only one now that has overlap with the Cambridge crew. He's got to be shouting down to the guy saying, they're still there, we've got to stick with them. Well, Cambridge being warned here, you can see that they're moving off their Middlesex station. According to Tony Reynolds, now this is interesting because if Oxford put a big push on here, Cambridge are being warned and they could be in trouble here if Oxford really dig in. And there is Jasper Parrish looking round and seeing the bow seat, James Forward in the bow of the Oxford boat. My goodness, it's risky. We've seen there a repeat of what happened in the women's crew. The crew that's in the women's race, the crew that's behind knows that when Cambridge are being warned, if Anna O'Hanlon can touch Oxford, she o can touch Cambridge, Cambridge are basically toast here. It's a bold move and it hasn't paid off as yet. Well, these are anxious glances around from Jasper Parrish with his brother just two seats away, Ollie Parrish in the seventh seat. There's Luca Ferraro in the stroke seat, setting the rhythm for the rest of the boat to follow. Cambridge being warned again. There is just a fraction of clear water between the two. But James Forward in the bow seat of Oxford, right at the back there, the light man, the technician, and Oxford are starting to move towards Cambridge again. So Cambridge once again being warned. This Oxford crew has got enough to get back in here. Let's not forget the name on the bows of this Oxford boat, OUBC 2003. 20 years ago, ago that Oxford crew rode back from down to win the race by one foot. This Oxford crew are going to know that, they remember that. That is going to be something they've watched, that's going to be something they've talked about. That's what they need to do now. So there we are, Hammersmith Bridge, waiting for its own better days to come, but the Green steel and wrought iron spires, the familiar site, comes into, into view and 80 to 85 percent of the time the crew that is in front of Hammersmith Bridge goes on to win the boat race. Cambridge in front at the moment but that lead remains the same and Oxford have got the strength and the power. Felix Drinkle in the stroke seat, he's going for his fourth boat race here, he's going for his first victory, the determination there from him to get finally what he calls a gold medal and not a silver in this race is enormous and that gap remains at just a fraction really and Middlesex, uh, Cambridge coming across in the Middlesex station again, Jasper Parrish looking around once again to see what that lead is. So Anna O'Hanlon, the Oxford Cox, is playing a very smooth game here. What she's doing is keeping her crew just close enough to Cambridge that Cambridge can't steer across and negate their bend. She's holding them out wide, and I think that's a really, really smooth move to go through. Well, we've seen the choppiest waters now. They will start to calm down as we round the bend here. Now, on the Surrey station, which is where Oxford are, the big bend plays in their favour. If Cambridge were to open a bit more clear water, they could choose that line. They could choose the Surrey station if, if it, effectively and negate the advantage of that bend. And they're trying to put a push in here, Cambridge. This, is, this one length distance between crews is actually a real vital point. It's a turning point in the race for both crews. If you're ahead, you want a break. 
if you're down, you need to stick. Just go down. Matt Edge there in the bow seat for Cambridge. And then Nick Mayhew, Noam Rouillet, the French athlete, and Brett Taylor, Thomas Lynch, the giant Canadian, Seb Benzakri, who's won before at Ely and Ollie Parrish, Luca Ferraro, and then Jasper Parrish. And then that is the gap to Oxford. Cambridge once again being warned as Oxford refused to go away. Oxford are doing a very good job here of holding in. That Cambridge rhythm is very, very strong and they're trying to get away and that Cox and Rohanlon isn't letting them get away. So as we look down on the gap, let's bring in Wayne Pullman once again on the water. Well, this is one of the best races we've seen in years. Cambridge did incredible work to lead to Hammersmith the way they did, but Oxford are not letting them get away. They're forcing Cambridge to row around the outside of this bend. But Cambridge now have to hold that position for the next few minutes and run out of Oxford's bend. Tony Reynolds standing in front of me here, not happy with the steering of Cambridge right now. Well, we can see it there, Wayne. It's, uh, it's extraordinary because Anna Hanlon is just, as you said, just forcing Cambridge out there. The gap is... We can't quite see it on that angle, the gap between the two crews, but Oxford just trying to hold Cambridge out in the Middlesex water. And this is a really uncomfortable position to row in when you're down physically, because the oars from the Cambridge boat are putting in so much disturbance to the water. You can feel that in the boat. And look at Anna Hanlon now. She's so focused, but that heart rate up at 175 beats per minute. You know, nearly three times what's normal for her. As you mentioned there, the dirty water that is coming down, the puddles they have to row through, you just don't get that stability of the oars going in. So Cambridge in the boss seat, controlling the river at the moment. But there we take you through the Oxford boat, James Forward and Bow, Tom Shaddock, Freddie Orpin, the giant, six foot eight and a half, Alex Bebb in four, James Doran, all six foot seven of them. These are the power men, JP Dufour, the Swiss Canadian, Tassilo von Muller, the German president, and then Felix Drinkel in the stroke seat, Anno Hanlon driving them all on. And again, the gap doesn't grow, but as Zoe was pointing out, now Cambridge can choose their station. There's enough of a gap. They're directly behind Oxford and they're sending down the puddles, sending down the dirty water. And this will be hard now for Oxford to come back. I think it will be hard, but I don't think it would be impossible. You can see that they're not letting Cambridge get away easy. And although Cambridge looked very smooth, we don't know how much work they've put in to get to that position. Oxford are still very aggressive, and you can hear Cambridge umpire Tony Reynolds warning them. So it looks like they've come right back again. Look at that move that Oxford have put in. We could see in that shot that their bows were once again crossing with the stern of the Cambridge boat. This race is far from over. Well, as soon as you get any sort of mere, near overlap of bow to stern again, then the respective boats have to go to the respective stations again. So Cambridge on the right-hand side, the North Bank, the Middlesex station, Oxford, Surrey, and now this is where Anna O'Hanlon... Let's listen into to Anna O'Hanlon here as she drives on the crew. On the right, hold. That's it, 12 and a half percent, boys. Let's go. Ready? In two. Do your bit. Ready? Go. Move. Together. Move. Together. Gain it. Move. Together. So she's just called a push. She's asked for an extra 12 and a half percent on the front end of the stroke. She's asking him to really grip onto their front end. That's the point where you put the blade into the water and push on the heel, push on the foot plate there. I heard that differently. I heard her asking for them to give their 12.5%, as in each eighth of them, you know, each one of the eight guys has to put in that 12.5%. They are one crew, they have to build that together. But what she's asking them for, ultimately, whichever one it is, is she's asking them to just keep that pressure on Cambridge, not let them go. You just look at the times there, ignore records, because records are built when you have good crews, yes, but more importantly, when you've got a strong, a strong tide coming in, carrying the crews forward. So what was more important there was Oxford five seconds behind Cambridge, and again, they're just hanging on there. It didn't look like five seconds to me, but the gap is not significant. Cambridge have not yet broken Oxford. And we're getting to the stage in the race now where Cambridge will have presumably been trying several stages to break away. And given that they haven't been able to, you've got to wonder as they come into their final stretch, how much more have they got left in the tank? Oxford are clinging on really, really well here. And I have absolute confidence that coach Rob Baker would have prepped Cambridge for this second half, but it's going to be a big ask for Cambridge to stay that far in front on this, coming into this latter half of the race. You see Chiswick be appear and the uh, boats bouncing around with the wash of the flotilla that follows 
the boat race. And Jasper Parish again, they glance around. But he doesn't need to tell his crew where Oxford are because they will see them and they'll see that they're still very much in this. Listening to Jasper there, he's very calm. You can tell that he's got absolute confidence in that his crew can now win this. And looking at the way that the stern pair, his brother Oli Parrish at seven, Luca Ferraro at stroke, the GB under-23 pair at this year's under-23 World Championships are rowing. I think they're pretty confident now that Cambridge are going to row away from this. Well, I'd say that lead now is beginning to look significant. And perhaps Oxford, well, they won't think it or believe it, realise it, but they won't have given up at all. But uh, Cambridge know every one of their oarsmen will be looking at that lead, and that will give them such a lift. Over that last minute, Cambridge didn't do anything big. They just consolidated. They were rowing a long stroke. They looked relaxed. You can see that they're in utter synchronicity, and that's such an important thing in rowing. You have to be aware that no matter which seat you're sitting in, what you're doing, every minute movement you make is going to affect the way that your teammates can row and what they feel and in that last minute and a half Cambridge have just started to sweep away no big moves just inches each stroke well, saw... it happens very rarely that crews come from behind at, at Barnesbridge to win and Barnesbridge is growing closer 1949 Cambridge came from just behind Oxford in 1952 did likewise then Oxford did in 2002 but that was when uh, it was an exhausted roar in the in the Cambridge board who was almost dead weight by the stage it's not a big lead but it's enough and this race really is there now for Cambridge to take you saw a stroke of Oxford Felix Drinkle looking round to see Cambridge and I think he will be slightly disheartened to see that they're further away than he imagined he's been in this position before three times now so the question is, is he going to be able to find enough? Is he going to be able to drive his men on enough to get that lead back? And Felix Drinkle is a, a, a great rower, a great oarsman who's achieved things internationally and, and for Oxford. But, as uh, Matthew was saying, they have four times in the boat race and it looks like being a fourth defeat. There he is in the stroke seat for Oxford. And they both shoot the central span of Barnesbridge. And with every stroke, Cambridge grow in stature, I'm sure, and get closer to Chiswick Bridge, round the bend. We're looking at a really beautiful rhythm from the Cambridge boat here. Look at the smoothness that they come forward, the way they put the blades in the water perfectly together. They look super relaxed. Oxford are now starting to sprint to the line early, which is the right thing to do if you're behind. You've got to throw everything at it early to try and get ahead. But Cambridge are comfortably in control of this finish. I think this is the bit for Cambridge where you've just got to think about the seven months that you've been training, you know, twice a day, squeezing in your studies, going to sleep, dreaming about the boat race, waking up, thinking about rowing. You know, it's all encompassing, isn't it? And it's exhausting, this race, but it's exhilarating. And this is the culmination of all that work now. And that is all that stands between Cambridge and victory again in the men's boat race, taking it back from Oxford, who won last year. And last year were very different crews, as it was in the women's race. Last year were crews of dark blue and light blue stacked with internationals. This year is more of a, a club feel, a university feel, more undergraduates in here, fewer internationalists. The same class again from Cambridge. This is, as we said, the lighter crew, the smaller crew, and it's going to be victory, I'm sure, and vindication for Rob Baker and his coaching, because this has been very, very impressive from Cambridge, and they're holding Oxford at bay, and this will be hard, hard work for Oxford now in the final moments of this race, because they're just not closing. I think this is a real, like I said in the women's race, a real turning of the tide for Cambridge. This is potentially going to be four wins out of five now for Cambridge. Let's get final thoughts from Wayne Palmer, who's been watching this race, and as a former Cambridge man, you must have been so impressed with this. Yeah, this has been a nice race from Cambridge, and they're looking very strong now, as you've been saying. Nice, long, sweeping strokes, nice timing. They've been able to relax a little bit in the last five minutes and, and stretch out, but they have not been let off the hook by this Oxford crew. Oxford crew have been behind since really the beginning, and they have not let off the pace. He kept Tony Reynolds very busy in the umpire's position. But certainly one of the best races we've seen in the last decade. And there is Felix Drinkle in the stroke seat. It'll hurt for him, it'll hurt for JP Dufour, who's looking for victory. Alex Bebb in the boat has won before. But as the water starts to chop up again, well, asking for one miracle effort from Oxford here. They are getting a bit closer. Looks like Felix Drinkle is really struggling here. He's put in so much work, his blade's late, he's 
looks like he's really struggling to keep it uh, together. Yeah, you can see that. You can see that blade of the stroke man, Felix Drinkle. And Oxford are coming down, throwing everything at this here. It's going to be a narrow victory for Cambridge, but narrow is enough in the boat race because victory is all that matters. It is Cambridge again. That's a great race and not a huge winning margin. But the light blues take it. They take it all again in all the boat races. And Jasper Parrish will clamber beyond Luca Ferraro to his brother Ollie Parrish. Brothers united in victory for Cambridge. A smile behind from Noam Muerle as well and handshakes. And again, all smiles. And as the umpire says, Tony Reynolds, fantastic race because it really was. But again, as we've said so many times in the boat race, it's binary. It's win or lose. It is all or nothing. And as Cambridge celebrates, Oxford will commiserate. And Felix Drinkle is in a, a pretty bad way there in the stroke seat for Oxford. We saw his his blade was waving around. We've got to get some attention to Felix Drinkle because, as Zoe de Toledo knows, in the 2012 boat with your now husband in the bow seat, and Alex, he, the, the effort put in will take its toll. This goes to show what a physical contest this is, and this is why we come back to the boat race year after year after year. These are essentially amateur athletes, and this man has put himself in such a position during this race that he is now needing potentially medical attention. And like you said, it happened to us in 2012. It's extremely scary for the crew, obviously for the individual. Just hope that they can get someone over to him quickly and just check that he's okay. You can see now his crew are rowing very quickly. Usually they'd be all knackered at the finish and they're rowing very quickly to get him over because they want to get him some attention. No, absolutely. And both boats coming in the R and L I are here as well. And all the medical attention will be there for, for Felix Drinkle. Usually you have both crews sitting in the echoes under Chiswick Bridge and the the cheers and the celebrations and the three cheers from one crew to the other. And that was so, so impressive from Cambridge because whatever the bookmakers said close to there is, well, <laughs> very seldom wrong. We thought that Oxford would be coming into this as slight favourites. But Cambridge, from the very start, they took control. You know, we'll have a think about that move that they made towards Craven Cottage. I think Jasper Parrish does take personally a massive, massive credit for their victory today. I think that move over towards Craven Cottage was incredibly bold. Well, Zoe and I weren't sure whether it was the right move to make. I got, in my gut, I felt it was right, but he clearly went with his gut, and that's a huge decision to make on the course. At just 20 years of age, to head over to the wall like that, I think got his crew out of that dirty water. They were able to get onto their rhythm, relax out, and I think that got them that lead that they then were able to grow through the race. I mean, we talk about rowing as the ultimate team sport, don't we? You know, there, there, are, no, there are no goal scorers, there are no assists, but the role of the cocks in this race in particular, in the boat race, is, is very visible. A bad, a bad coxing performance, like I know personally, can uh, lose you the race in a split second. A good one can win one. Jasper did something very bold there. I, I, I think maybe if Anna had stayed on the line, it, they might have still been level and then Jasper would have well, had to come back over, but well, you never know. Well, looking at the margin of victory at the end there, what a, a, one and a third lengths, whatever it might have been, we'll get the final verdict. But that was almost taken out at that, with that move. That move made a big, big difference early on. I think it was an incredibly impressive decision to make under pressure. And I think it shows the trust that the crew have in their cocks that they were able to capitalize on the bold decision because you don't have the time or the mental capacity to question those decisions. So if you don't trust it in your gut, you won't push hard and you won't be able to get your boat ahead. So that was a again, massive display of trust. We talked about it in the women's boat race that this, uh, this period of dominance that Cambridge have, yes, there was an Oxford victory uh, last year in the men's boat race, but apart from that, it has been mostly Cambridge across all of the reserves and the lightweights and the women's and the men's and they really have formed something very very impressive i think like we said before cambridge are just on this winning roll and it's so difficult to break that once it's going Cambridge are one club. They've amalgamated the women's programme, the men's programme and the lightweight programmes under one CUBC umbrella. And I think that is what's contributed to this win here, everyone training together. So there we are, the boats moving in to shore. Cambridge victorious again in the boat race. The 168th men's boat race goes to Cambridge. Thank you to our commentary team calling what was one of the most scintillating, dramatic men's boat races we have seen for a long time. But ultimately, the win and the glory going to Cambridge. So it is a Cambridge clean sweep 
in 2023. They won the women's race, they won the men's race, and Jasper Parrish, the Cox, now at the age of 19, having won the women's race last year, becomes the youngest to win both. And Cambridge just coming into land at Mortlake. As with the women's crew, so many smiles and familiar faces greeting them. I can see some of the victorious women in the background. Freya Quito with a jumper on now because it is a little chilly out there, about eight or nine degrees, but they won't be feeling that right now, that men's crew. And we can see Oxford on the left of your picture now just coming into boat as well. We send our best wishes to stroke man Felix Drinkle in his fourth boat race, needing medical attention there. And he's out the boat now, but we are going to go and hear from a victorious member of the Cambridge crew now, Ollie Parrish. A delighted Ollie Boyne. Um, we're just seeing the sort of uh, subdued celebrations after uh, Felix being helped off the boat there uh, by the lifeguard. But my goodness, take nothing away from what Cambridge has achieved actually throughout the entire weekend. But what a great performance by the boat, by the crew today. Yeah, it's been an absolutely incredible performance by all the crews. Um, wins across the board for the club. It's a fantastic sign for the club as a whole and every crew had absolutely fantastic races. Couldn't be happier. Difficult conditions out there for that. I mean, it was almost at one point carbon copy of what we saw from the women's. They got so close. Yeah, yeah. The conditions really are difficult. Every time you thought it was going to get a bit better, somehow got a bit worse. But that's the tide way, and that's what makes this race so special. In terms of the effort, the hours, the sweat and tears that this crew particularly have put into things, um, just try and sum it up for us. I'm not sure we put into words. I mean, it's it's day in, day out, you know, all the time for, for six, seven months. And what it means to this guy, these guys, is just absolutely everything. And, and to see it materialise as this kind of win is is just everything to these guys and, and to the to the team as a whole. Oh, a huge congratulations. Well done. Very much. Thank you. So that is Oliver Boyne, the Cambridge club president this year. Didn't make it into the blue boat, but doesn't matter. He is a winner anyway. Cambridge are the winners. Uh, Ollie Parrish named the club captain in that blue boat. And we're now just seeing overhead then the wash dying away. The embers of the race coming to an end in 2023. So Oxford, you can just see that darker colored boat down there. They are now in and on land. So we will wait to see if we're going to hear from a member of their crew. Of course, those scenes at the end, just a little bit of uh, a dampener, but a reminder, as Zoe de Toledo was telling us about the exertion that these uh, athletes put into this race, 6.8 grueling kilometers. It's three times longer than an Olympic racing course of 2,000 meters. So it is a huge, huge effort for these athletes. Commiserations then to the Oxford crew just stood up on the bank. You can see how much the water has come in. This is the tidal part of the Thames and the bank now shrinking away. We can just see some of those crew members, Anna O'Hanlon, the Australian Cox from Somerville College, just patting James Doran on the shoulder. A hug, but an acknowledgement of how hard they push. So it's getting quite cozy up here, but I have two delighted brothers, Jasper and Ollie Parrish. Oh my goodness, how do you sum this one up, Ollie? What a, what a race. What a race to finish it off. Uh, yeah, I've been at Cambridge four years, come in in the glory days, one, two before. Then we lost one last year, and now I finally get to win on the Tideway. Absolute pleasure, and with my brother. Oh, what a man, treat. the rush of emotions, man. We crossed the line, there's just nothing like it. And, and what a race, yeah, as Ollie says, that was, that was the fun of our lives. Yeah. And I'm going to remember this day for a very, very long time. Big, big coach Rob Baker, Marco Vanovic, everyone in the crew. All the Goldie guys, everyone. Full credit to Oxford, epic race. Uh, yeah, what a treat, what a treat. And no mean feat either. I mean, Oxford had chosen Surrey. The conditions yeah. out there are choppy as well. Yeah. Got pretty close at times. Yeah, really, really choppy, we saw there. Yeah, got out the blocks cleanly and just, you know, tucked in a little bit, got out the, got out the rough stuff. I think Jasper Cox did an amazing race, really did, did a good job for us, yeah. I like the way as well, you clambered over to get to your brother at the end. Yeah, you know, what a race, what a way to... Yeah, I know, we've been rowing, we haven't really overlapped the last seven or eight years since we started rowing, and now we finally get to row together. What a treat, and to win, it's just amazing, just amazing.
Yeah. What a huge day for the Parish family and for a great weekend for Cambridge as well. Really well done. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to try and um, speak to uh, Martin. Uh, I know how much you enjoyed this race, Martin. Take us through it. <laughs> What a sensational race, Lee. It was just amazing. It was so close right to the finish, but really just from the off, you had to see Oxford just had that advantage on that Surrey station. They did so well on the start, but here was an inspired bit of coxing. Look how close Jasper Paris is to Fulham football ground. You don't see anybody do that line, but he took it because the water was flatter and it took Cambridge out to a half a length lead, inspired bit of coxing by the 19 year old. And look what it gave them. Cambridge just rowing really loose, really smooth. Luca Ferraro setting a fantastic rhythm in the stern. Just going out to clear water as we come round by Hammersmith Bridge. Yes, so Jasper Parish can move across and negate the advantage that Oxford have round that Surrey bend. Nice and smooth rhythm from Luca Ferraro. Ollie Parish, the St Paul's schoolboy, just backing him up in the seven seat. Looks beautiful. And that rhythm... So we are waiting for the medal presentations. You can see Mortlake, Anglian and Alpha Boat Club there. The presentation platform over to the left-hand side and looking at the Oxford crew now who are just taking a few moments on the bank to think back over that race. What a race it was. Clean, aggressive start. Oxford on the Surrey bank. Cambridge on the Middlesex and... Even the geese enjoying <laughs> the aftermath of that. <laughs> but uh, a huge move. That was the real talking point we just saw there, didn't we? Um, Jasper Parrish taking the Cambridge boat into the more sheltered water by Craven Cottage in Fulham. Very bold, but it paid off. So let's see if we can hear from the losing Oxford crew now. What a race that was. Let's get their thoughts on that one with Lee McKenzie. President Tassilo von Mueller. Um, difficult scenes at the end with Felix. Um, can you give us any information on, on, on how he is? Uh, no, I don't know. He wasn't great in the boat. But yeah, I hope, I hope he's all right. Um, we've heard he's conscious, um, but also, I mean, it is sport. You've worked so hard for this. Um, he, Felix has worked so hard for this so many so many years. Disappointment across the board for Oxford. Yeah, yeah, it's not the result we wanted to come out of this with. But like you say, it's sport, and it's, it's a it's a battle between two teams. So one one team will always lose, um, and that's the reality of this event. Tesla, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Tasselo von Muller there, this year's Oxford men's president. Towering at six foot five, but his mood lower, lower, lower than that because he missed out on blue boat selection this year, made it into the boat this year, but having to finish with defeat. And once again, we just send our best wishes to Felix Drinkle, who was sitting in the stroke seat, setting the rhythm of the boat. His fourth boat race had lost three times, and today has had to be uh, taken out by medical staff after uh, all the exertion of that race. And we're just seeing, you can see by the uh, boat club to the left-hand side, there is a, a podium there. We're gonna see the crews heading up over there in a moment. They'll be presented their medals be Martin Cross taking you through that. Look at those shades of, of different colours of blue, the light and the dark. The light coming out on top in the women's race and in the men's. So that takes Cambridge's overall wins in the men's boat race to 86, Oxford on 81. And we've got a little parakeet in the trees there. We see a lot of them around. West London at this time of year. We're not too far from Kew Gardens, in fact, where you see thousands of them flocking the botanical gardens. That's just a little further up the river. But now it is going to be time for the medal presentation. So we are heading back to Mortlake and we'll see the crews get their medals for this year's 2023 boat races.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the trophy presentations for the Gemini Boat Race 2023. First of all, we will have the presentations for the 77th Women's Boat Race. Joining me here, the presentation group, Acting Vice-Chancellor of Cambridge University, what a day your guys have had, Dr. Anthony Freeling, and Head of Gemini UK, Stephanie Ramazan, Gemini, the title sponsor for the race. Before we do anything else, let's give commiserations to a fantastic effort from the Oxford crew. They left nothing out there on the course. It was a great road from them. And now let's welcome the winners up on stage from Cambridge University Boat Club. Bow, Karina Graff, cool up there. Rosie Millard, the lightweight in the two seats, won an open weight boat race. Alex Riddell Webster, the junior international in three. The American combination, Jenna Armstrong at four. Freya Keto in the five seat. Isabel Bastian at six. Claire Brion, the Canadian, in the seven seat. Quiva Dempsey, the president, and their coach, Paddy Ryan, has just got on to the medal ceremony. James Trotman, the Cox, is he there? James Trotman there, the Cox. So, uh, ladies, I would ask you to pick up your Jeroboam of Chapel Down sparkling English wine, please. Yeah, don't do anything with it yet. And the president, Quiva, would you come here, please? And I'd ask you to lift the trophy. <laughs> Cambridge University Boat Club. <laughs> uh, what incredible scenes there. So that was Cambridge winning their 77th women's boat race and <laughs> celebrating with those Jeroboams of sparkling wine. We're just having a look at Hammersmith Bridge. It all looks a little calmer now, doesn't it? Helped by the fact that uh, the bridge has actually been closed to cars for the last three years because of structural issues. So it's nice and quiet over there. You can still row underneath as we saw in those races earlier. It was closed to rowers for a little while as well. So Cambridge women, doing what they expected. They were the pre-race favourites. Five-time champions coming into this and they've sealed victory again. And now it is time for the men's victory presentation in just a moment. As the women just get hugs from their male counterparts. You wonder what their heart rate is at the moment. We saw during the racing that they were rocketing up, even the Coxes themselves who weren't racing. see light blue really taking over the images in front of us. It's going to be the men's presentation in just a moment, as I said. So we've got um, the uh, men's crew just lining up, ready to walk up to the top where Martin Cross will greet them with uh, their own Jeroboam's, you'd imagine. Oh, yeah, you can see them lined up, actually, on the stage just down there. Nice crowd building. You see the boats in the background. Cambridge women filling up their trophy. Quiva Dempsey with her back to us at the moment. The club president having to have a drink in front of her teammates. Time for the men's presentation. presentation of the 168th men's boat race trophy. And the presentation group for this prize giving, the Vice Chancellor of Oxford University, Professor Irene Tracy, and once more, Head of Gemini UK, the race's title sponsors, Stephanie Ramazan. Commiserations go to the losing Oxford crew. What a fantastic effort and what a fantastic race they put in. They were one of the four crews today that painted the town light blue. It's now time to welcome the winners on stage, Cambridge University Boat Club, the lightweight Matt Edge, 
Mick Mayhew in the two seat, rode so long, Noam Willey, the Frenchman in three. Brent Lynch in the four seat, the Canadian Tom Lynch at five, what a race he's had. Sam Ben Ricky, one of the St Paul schoolboys in six. Ollie Parrish, one of the two brothers in seven. Luca Ferraro, what a great job he did at stroke. And Jasper Parrish, another of the Parrish brothers, an amazing job in the Cox's seat. Joining him is the Cambridge president, Ollie Boyd. Gentlemen, could I ask you please to get ready with your Jeroboams of Chapel Down sparkling English wine. And Ollie, if I could ask you please to lift the Gemini Boat Race trophy. The scenes of celebration. Ollie Boyne there, the club president, not actually racing in the blue boat, didn't make it into that top boat, but he rode for the Goldie Reserves crew. That is why he's wearing those golden colored trousers. And just in case you missed it, they won as well. A full clean sweep for Cambridge Martin. Uh, Martin Cross said it's there. They won both reserve races as well. So London, West London, the Tideway truly is painted light blue. And what great scenes if you're a Cambridge supporter today, Cambridge alumni or one of those teams all up on the podium. What a moment for Cambridge. The Tideway is theirs. Screams of delight. Champagne flowing. <laughs> and more members joining and joining. And as Martin Cross is just saying, you might be able to hear him there. The tradition now, of course, is to see the Coxes get flung into the oh, frosty, freezing waters of the tidal Thames. So we'll hopefully see that in just a moment's time. Back to the start line there, Putney Bridge, a different scene now. It was standstill just uh, an hour or so ago as the whole of West London waited with bated breath to see which colour blue would come out on top. We know the answer now. And we're going to see the Coxes hopefully make their way in <laughs> as well. Right, so we are looking out for James Trotman, I believe. Hopefully about to be chucked in by his uh, women's crew. Can't see him there on our picture. There he is, coming in from the left. And the cameraman just telling them exactly what kind of shot they want. This is a moment Coxes honestly dream about. One of the former Cambridge winning Coxes I interviewed earlier this week, previewing the boat race, I was saying she thought about this moment. And then when it came, she couldn't believe it. So James Trotman, just 18 years old, GB junior team member in 2022, is about to get a taste of the Thames water. Probably not quite as sweet as the uh, sparkling wine they were just tasting on the podium. And the crew going in with him as well. <laughs> we can see Jasper Parrish actually warming up behind, taking off the wellies, preparing himself for the moment. The James Trotman and the women, a huge win for them, taking control really at Hammersmith Bridge, the pre-race favourites, and then never 
really losing control. The men, it was a dramatic affair. It was a battle of the Coxes. And Parrish, there, the man with the slightly long hair, the long trousers on, about to be dunked by his teammates. Wonder how far they can throw him. That might be their aim. Have they got energy left? Oh, quivering like a salmon in the air. And into the Thames he goes. He doesn't look to mind too much. He did it last year with the women as well. So a reminder then, the Tideway, the Thames, is light blue today. Wins in the 77th women's boat race and the 168th men's boat race as well. From Putney to Mortlake, they were in control and in the reserve races as well. And all we see now on our screens is light blue. So it's been great having you with us. What drama, what excitement. We'll do it all again next year as ever. Thanks to Cambridge and Oxford for such brilliant racing. From me, Katie Smith, it's been a delight. Have a great rest of your weekend. Get on, get on! Go, Sam, go! Go, Sam, go!